everybody, it's Mrs. Hoffworth. We're going to talk about kinetic molecular theory of gases today. Okay, so kinetic molecular theory has five key statements that underpin the way we think about how a gas behaves. First off, the first thing we're going to assume is that gas particles are in constant random motion. Okay, second thing, volume of gas particles is negligible compared to the total volume of the gas. In other words, a gas is mostly empty space. Those particles are tiny and they don't take up very much of the space that the gas occupies. Third, attractive and repulsive forces are negligible. So we think of each particle as a hard sphere that's going to bounce off other particles, but they're not going to stick together and they're not going to repel. Fourth, Collisions are elastic in that when the particles collide, energy can be transferred from one to the other, but energy is not lost. And this means that the average kinetic energy of your gas is going to remain constant at any particular temperature. And fifth, the average kinetic energy of a gas is proportional to the temperature. So as the average kinetic energy of your gas molecules increases, so does the temperature of the gas. These are five assumptions that help us explain why gases behave the way that, we, that they do. If you think about it, the fact that a gas is compressible, that's because gases are mostly empty space, so you can easily squish the particles closer together. If you think about the fact that pressure increases as temperature increases, well, temperature is proportional to average kinetic energy. Those particles will be moving faster which means you're going to have more collisions and they're going to hit harder. So for both of those reasons, you'll see the pressure, that force due to the collisions of the particles, will increase. And so pretty much all of the gas law relationships that we've thought about can be explained in terms of kinetic molecular theory. I want to zoom in and take a closer look about what that last statement, the fact that average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, what that tells us about the speed of the particles. So if we have one gas and we look at the speed of its particles at different temperatures. At low temperatures, we have the blue curve that you see down there. And so you'll see that we have, an av we have kind of a, a peak and then it tails off and that the, the shape of the peak is a little broader, or I guess the base of the peak is a little broader as you go to higher molecular speeds. Okay. If you increase the temperature, you will see the whole peak shift and broaden. This is your Boltzmann distribution. We've seen it at least three times already this year. Um, but we do see that broadening because why, since we have more available molecular speeds, you have fewer particles at any individual speed. A couple of things I want to point out with this. Your most probable speed, and so the symbol that is given to this in chemistry land is U and then a lowercase mp. Um, that lowercase u is actually going to be the symbol that's being used for speed in this particular version. And so our most probable speed corresponds to the highest tip of your distribution, where you have the most molecules with a particular speed. The average speed is going to be a little bit bigger. So your average speed, since the curve is not symmetrical, your average speed is going to be a little bit higher than your most probable speed. And then the last one is URMS. This is your root mean square speed. Okay, so what is this? This is the speed of a molecule that has the average kinetic energy. And it turns out that this root mean square speed is just a smidgen higher than your average speed. Um, in practice, all of these are really close together and very similar in terms of what speed this corresponds to, but there are slight differences. As we continue working, it's actually the root mean squared speed, the one that's related to kinetic energy that we'll be using more than most probable or average speed. Let's take a look at this motion again, but now instead of focusing on one particular molecule at different temperatures and seeing how that changes things, let's talk about how mass impacts things. At a particular temperature, every gas will have the same average kinetic energy. Well, kinetic energy, if you recall, is gonna be one half m velocity squared 
Um, but really what we're focusing on with our velocity, the way we're going to use it here, is that root mean squared speed squared. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, in order to have the same kinetic energy, if the mass is larger, you have to have a lower average speed. If the mass is smaller, you're going to have to have a larger average speed. So what we see is that heavier molecules have a lower average speed. Same kinetic energy, same average kinetic energy, but a lower average speed because it takes less speed to get to the same kinetic energy. And so lighter particles will move faster at the particular temperature and heavier particles will move slower at a particular temperature. Mathematically, um, we can relate this to molar mass using the equation I have down below where your average root mean squared speed, the bar over the U represents average. So your average root mean squared speed will be the square, excuse, with the square root of three RT divided by the molar mass. So temperature is our Kelvin temperature, R is going to be our 8.314 again, and M is going to be our molar mass. So as we said now three times, maybe more, the larger the molar mass, since it's in the denominator, the smaller the speed is going to be. It is logical. The fact that your particles are moving and perhaps moving at different rates and different speeds has an impact on the motion of those gases. And the two motions I want to talk about briefly here are effusion and diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from high to low concentration. You're pretty familiar with this one. Um, this is this imagining you've got a you know, perfume in a room and it's going to bounce its way to your nose. Um, it doesn't get to travel in a straight line path because there's lots of particles that it's going to collide with on the way, but it's going to travel through the air. And that movement from high concentration to low is diffusion. Mathematically, actually really complicated because of all of the collisions. But it turns out there is something called effusion that gives you a mathematical similar result, but is much easier to actually do mathematics with and come up with a way to predict how long it will take for a particular particle to spread to effuse or to diffuse throughout a room. Effusion is the flow of gas at low pressure through a tiny hole. Because we're at low pressure, there's relatively few collisions. And since you're moving through a tiny hole, you're not talking about um, how long does it take to move past other particles. Really, you're just saying, well, how, what's the likelihood it's going to hit that hole and escape out? And so the more collisions you're going to have with that particular hole, the more chances you have, I guess, to strike that particular hole, the more likely it is that your particle is going to escape. And so as a result, the faster the particle is moving, the faster it is better, the faster it is going to effuse because it's going to be able to have more chances to escape through that goal. And there's some nice math that can be done. And I've kind of got the reduction on here. If you want to see the kind of derivation, it's in your textbook. But this expression is called Graham's law of effusion. Mathematically, we can apply it to diffusion because the same ratio is seen, but it's not, strictly speaking, the same process. But what this says is that the rate of effusion of two different particles, when you compare them, it depends on the square root of the relative molar masses. But notice that on the equation, I've got rate 1 over rate 2. And then in the molar mass part, it's molar mass 2 over molar mass 1. What this basically says is that the faster molecule will have a higher rate of effusion because it'll have a lower molar mass. Now, when you look at effusion problems, often you'll talk about the rate, how quickly it's happening, but you can also talk about how long it takes for the effusion to happen. That's time. Rate has units of, um, you know, something like meters per second. And then time is how many seconds it takes, say, to go to a meter something along those lines. So these guys are going to be inverses of one another. And so you'll notice I kind of have this equation in two parts. Here is part one. You can talk about how the rate changes with respect to molar mass. And here is equation two. You can talk about how the time it takes for effusion to occur depends on molar mass. Either way, these relationships make sense. 
the slower the particle is moving, either because it's colder or because it's bigger, the slower the rate will be for effusion and the longer it will take in terms of time for effusion to occur. So in summary, um, kinetic molecular theory explains why we think we see the properties of an ideal gas. So what's going on with those particles on a particular level? What assumptions are we making? We, it is really important that you are able to connect how changing the temperature impacts the motion of your particles and how changing the mass impacts the temperature of the particles. And underlying both of those is the statement that at a particular temperature, any gas will have the same average kinetic energy. Because we can understand how those particles move in terms of their speed, we can then predict how quickly they will effuse or defuse.